Hello everyone, I'm Johnette Williams, and welcome to a special live simulcast edition of Women of Grace. I so look forward to these opportunities to be with you via television and radio. Our phone screeners are standing by, and they're looking forward to taking your calls. Your comments, insights, inspirations, and words of encouragement are always welcomed and appreciated. I'll be giving you the phone number throughout the program, and we'll do our best to get you on the air when you call in. We're also available to you via social media. Just go to EWTN Radio's YouTube channel or Facebook page. Use the chat feature to send us your questions or comments, and we'll do our best to address them during our show. Today's guest is Father Sheenan Bouquet, President of Human Life International. He travels the globe for the sake of life, the dignity of the human person, and the restoration of the family. His is a tough call. It reminds me of the passage in Scripture where God says to the prophet Ezekiel, I am sending you to people who are stubborn and who do not obey. And yet, like the prophet, he goes nonetheless to speak on behalf of those who cannot speak for themselves. In our time together today, Father Bouquet is going to take us back to a watershed moment that has much to do with the injustices against human dignity that we see in our world today. We're going to talk about the prophetic fulfillment of now St. Paul VI's watershed encyclical, Humanae Vitae, and the subsequent devastation of the institution of the family. This is a serious program about serious matters. And some of our content may not be suitable for children, but serious times require we talk seriously about realities so that we can righten the listing ship of our culture, lest it completely capsize. We are women of grace from the throne of the Lord. Humanae Vitae, and you become convinced that St. Paul VI was a prophet. Though few appreciated his encyclical, Humanae Vitae, and even scoffed at it, the words he penned have proven true. In short order, marriage, family, and life were under attack. And as we have come to see, the devastation didn't stop there. Now even the anthropology of the human person is under attack. Gender ideology has an icy grip upon the major institutions of our society and is attempting to deconstruct its perspective of the human person's reality at its most fundamental level. Here to talk with us not only about the problem, but to offer us the solution is Father Sheenan Bouquet, President of Human Life International. Let's welcome him. Oh. Father, welcome so oh, much. It's great to be back with you Thank again. Thank you. It's great to have you here. I always appreciate uh, having you as a guest and hearing from you uh, because you keep us very on the beat and the pulse of what's mm -hmm. going on culturally today with regard to all of the life issues and the dignity of the human person. Mm -hmm. And I just really want to thank you so much mm -hmm. for the work you do in giving your fiat to the Lord. We need you. We need that voice out there well, today. Thank you very much. And it's, 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 it really, it's a privilege. It's an honor, you know, to serve HLI because, you know, I never really thought I would be doing the work that I'm doing and on, the, on a such a global scale, but to have the privilege of meeting people like yourself and others around the world so dedicated, so committed to the cause for life and family and who are making heroic efforts to change the conversation, to re-engage people in a, in a different way of looking at life and family. So it, I always tell people I'm the servant of the servants, really, because it, it, I'm amazed and humbled by the heroic work that's being done. Well, you know, and, and it's an interesting uh, reality that we've been at this work for a very long right. time. And, uh, you know, 50 years since Humanae Vitae, uh, and with regard to what's happened in the subsequent years, the intervening years, uh, it, it, it's astounding to see how prophetic that word was. And for those of us that labor, you know, in the field of this uh, and are really uh, in some way involved on a daily basis with it, we can feel a little beleaguered. Yeah. But I think that this is the time to, to, to really, you know, um, 
as, as it would say in sacred scripture, to gird our loins and go about the business, exactly, right? Exactly, exactly, and to be joyful. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the great lesson of Advent, really. It's a chance for us to really take a look at what gives us our, our strength and our courage. And of course, it's the Lord Jesus Christ and the gift of, of his life and his love and, and the opening of salvation to us. And so this is what gives us the strength to go forth and to burst into that conversation. But it is absolutely the truth. I mean, it's, it's a very difficult conversation as the world continues to digress into secular ways and definitions of life. We're preaching a very contrary message, which is not always welcomed and actually despised. Mm -hmm. And so, and also we see many losses, as we see many gains, and but we see many difficult moments from Ireland st struggle oh, recently yes. to the Philippines struggling, you know, to maintain its culture. And even in Latin America, which has been bastions of, of great places of Catholicism, and you're watching them collapse under this weight and this pressure. And it can be very discouraging to many people, and many people have fallen into the trap of despair, even to saying, you know, what's the point anymore? And but it, that's not the answer. The answer is, is, as you said, you know, you know, put on the armor of Christ, get yourself ready, go out into that battle. And for me, it's always been the image of David facing Goliath, you know. And I and I like to add a little bit to the scripture. And the point being, it's like putting on armor every morning, and it's all all the chinks are out of it. You've you've polished it. You've hung it on the hook for the night. You get up the next morning, you put it back on, and you go right back into the battle, knowing that you're going to get it all dented again and it's going to get tarnished again, and you come back, unknot, take all the dents out, hang it back on the hook, and you get out the next day. But it's, it's a great spirit the saints teach us yes. to be joyful servants and to trust that God is in the, in the midst of all of this work, no matter what we faced. And I, and I think that's what Paul VI also understood as he said in the opening of Humanae Vitae that, you know, when many people wanted him to change and uh, to maybe accommodate more of a secular uh, understanding of marriage and, and, of course, it's you know, human sexuality, but he said, no, I must stand in what has always been true and what always will be true. So his heroic stand gives us the reason to also be heroic. And I think that's important. I think it's very important. And of course, you know, there are certain things that are just immutable. Correct, exactly. <laughs> you can't change them. No. And you can't change human nature. Correct. You can, you can uh, in some ways, you can, uh, you know, you, you can surgically do things. Um, but basically what you're, you're doing is you're causing an affront to God, but right. you're also, uh, in a very serious way, affecting and damaging the human person at its core. Exactly. And I want to talk a little bit about humanae vitae. You know, 1968 was when it was promulgated, and it didn't take very long. And I'm, I have to say, Catholics jumped on the bandwagon right. as much as the rest of the population did with regard to right. contraception. And at that time, uh, you know, the... Uh, wholesale distribution, really, at the beginning mm -hmm. of that, of the birth control pill, Correct. which came around in 1960. It didn't take long. 1973 right. was really a key year uh, that began to show the prophetic nature, I think, of this encyclical. Right. We had two very important events that happened then, Roe v. Wade, right. which legalized abortion, and the second was no-fault marriage, which Correct. was the beginning of the destruction of the family institution. That's, That's right. Yeah, all these things, you know, obviously were floating, you know, uh, of course, many of them before, Humanae Vitae and those that would come after it, but it, it all spoke of the same truth, and that was there was an affront being made against the dignity of marriage, the dignity of life, and people really were wanting to embrace, and I think it says something of our own nature, which is wounded, you know, because of the original sin, we're still wounded, and, and of course, because of our own personal sins, it complicates the whole matter, and if we're not cooperating with grace and, and participating, you know, in God's holy will, then we, we tend to move towards what's easy. We think the easy is the answer, and but really these are band-aids. And what we've seen today is a consequence of that band-aid approach. So if, as a couple saying, okay, we're going to embrace contraception, but it's not just the actual pill or the, or the prophylactic they may be using, but you know, they're blocking their cooperation with God. They're not being generous with themselves. There's a selfish motivation. And this mentality not only affects them physically and sexually, but it affects them in their totality. It changes the way they think. It changes the way he treats treats her, the way she looks at him, and, and it becomes objectified, and, and the whole gift of intimacy and conjugal love and the ends of marriage begin to be split. It's almost like it's ruptured, and this is what we heard John Paul talk about, we heard Paul VI talk about, we heard Pope Francis talk about, that this is a reality that, you know, and so today we're watching marriages uh, fall apart, you know, high percentages of divorce, 
cohabitation, strong promiscuity. We're watching STDs out the roof, uh, you know, growing. The whole issue of AIDS that really is not, not in, in the headlines anymore, but yet you travel with me into Africa and other parts of the world, you see where it still has, uh, you know, endemic numbers. And it's, it's, it's really a challenge you know, to this secular mentality, which is really falling and, and failing, and it's, it's producing nothing good, but yet they keep pushing it, you know, and, and, and I think that's the challenge for us as Catholics and Christians and those with a very different anthropology on the, on the human person. We have to reintroduce, and that's what John Paul talked about in Evangelium Vitae, you know, in that very opening paragraphs, that we have to reteach people how to love, defend, respect, and serve life. And I apply that not only to defending the child in the womb, of course, or the aged or the handicapped, but to marriage. It applies the same thing to marriage because people don't know what married life is. They don't understand the beauty of marriage, the sanctity of marriage, why one man, one woman, uh, in an exclusive, indissoluble union, what makes that so immutable? And why is it so necessary in this culture? Yeah, you know, and, and, and that's the question, isn't it? Uh, and, and the funny thing is, this is what I really grapple with. This whole secular notion defies logic. There's right. no logic in it. Right. You know, we're told to look at the tree and judge it by its fruits. There's nothing fruitful, you know, right. in, in any aspect exactly. of this, not only fruitful in the way of bearing children, but there's nothing fruitful for the individuals involved. As you say, exactly. you know, uh, individuals become objectified. The husband looks at the wife uh, through a gaze of lust rather than love, Correct. very different things. One of the unfortunate fallouts of this is that our young people don't know the difference between lust no. and love. No. They have no notion of it whatsoever. Uh, the wife often looks at her husband in the same way. Uh, but we also see the devastation that's been caused by disease. As you right. talk about the STDs, you talk about right. AIDS. Uh, but the answer to that is, well, let's just come up with something that right. we can fix this disease. Exactly. Let's not cure what's causing it, right. because that becomes a matter of human rights. Correct. And right. we've got this very faulty notion exactly. about rights. There's nothing right about the human right. rights that we uh, purport today. Exactly. Is it exactly. And that's what, uh, again, Pope John Paul II talked about in Veritatis Splendor, which I think our audience, if they haven't had a chance really to, to read, I would strongly, strongly encourage. be a great Advent uh, reflection because it, he, he really addresses this. What is a freedom and what is a false freedom? And where do our freedoms really begin? And it really, our freedom originates in our own dignity. It starts in our own humanity, who we are, what we're made for. And so when we misunderstand that, then obviously all these other false freedoms begin to be seen as legitimate. And that's really the, the core of this. But again, if we just peel back, you know, when you look at marriage in, in our society, you know, it's the single institution upon which our society is built. This is what the Catechism of the Catholic Church teaches. And, and it's so re remarkable that this wonderful institution is being trying to be redefined. And th the consequence of that is not going to be good. And we already see this. But it, it is amazing, as you say, that people, regardless, despite all that, knowing the evil that's going to occur, knowing the damage that's going to occur. But I think that for, our, for us, that what I think is so beautiful is uh, the family is where we learn the core values, where we learn the gospel values, where we learn moral values, where we learn right from wrong, good from bad. You know? and, and this is where God places this, his authority in mom and dad to teach us and to reflect himself and his law within the family structure. So if a family is in, in, a, in a holistic way living this reality, well, society benefits. In society grows, it, 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 it produces great fruit, but the opposite, what we're seeing today is so when today many of our young people don't understand their own religious tenets, mm -hmm. they don't understand the moral principles, uh, the whole gospel value is, is really foreign to them. Why? Because their family is broken. They're not being given this in the family structure. That's and right. so our society, so kindness, gentleness, thoughtfulness, appreciation, thankfulness, gratitude, just basic things that you and myself really take for granted because they're a part of us, you know, are not a part of every, part, of every person in society. No, and I want to pick up on that point, Father when we come back from our break. Friends, we do want to remind you that we're live with you today. That means that you can join our conversation. I'm going to give you a couple of numbers by which you can do that. You can call us toll-free here in North America. It's 800-221-9460. That's 800-221-9460. If you're outside of North America, your number 205-271-9460. 2980 205 271 2980 you see that coming up on your screen
screen at home. Also want to remind you we're available to you through social media. EWTN Radio's YouTube channel and Facebook page offers the chat feature that you need to put your question, comment, inside inspiration or word of encouragement in there and we'll receive it right here. We're looking forward to being with you on the other side of the break. Stay tuned. Hello friends, I am happy to invite you to become a member of Women of Grace Exclusive. That's right, an exclusive membership. By becoming a Women of Grace Exclusive member, you will have anytime, anywhere access to a vast library of resources, including our television programs, radio shows, and podcasts, our archived webinars by outstanding presenters, church documents and articles, and so much more. It's affordable, educational, and inspirational. With one click, more than 25 years of resources are yours on an exclusive basis. It's a membership program for such a time as this. Visit our website at www.womenofgrace.com for more information. Again, that's www.womenofgrace.com. Hello, family. On November 29th, EWTN won its nearly seven-year-long battle against the HHS contraceptive services mandate. When we began our fight in early 2012, I never imagined that it would take so long to resolve. I'm happy that both the government and the courts finally agreed with EWTN's argument that we should be able to continue to provide our employees with health care coverage consistent with our Catholic beliefs without facing crushing fines and penalties. This is a good decision for EWTN and a victory for religious liberty. I want to thank you, our EWTN family, for your continued support and prayers throughout this difficult fight. And though this battle is behind us, the threats to religious liberty continue. Together, let's resolve to always stand firm in the face of those challenges. Thank you, and may God bless you. Our guest today, Father Sheenan Bouquet. He is the president of Human Life International. We're so happy to have him on our program today talking about very serious issues here. We have to speak about them frankly. Uh, so if you think that it's too sensitive a topic for your children, you might be aware of that. Uh, we cannot just hide these matters anymore. We've got to give voice to them in, in any way that we possibly can. Uh, inviting you to use the numbers that are there for you on the screen to join us today. We're looking forward to hearing your insights your inspirations, your words of encouragement, and also your concerns as we move forward in our program. You know, Father, we went to the break and you were talking about the fact that the family is the place where children learn. They learn morality, their conscience is formed. Uh, you know, we hope that that's going on. Uh, that's the way that it's meant to be. And it occurs to me that socialization in its most basic areas takes place within the context right. of a family. And, uh, you know, uh, when we watch children interacting, mom and dad, they have to correct things that are not charitable. They have to correct things that are selfish. They have to correct things that uh, they see that the child is doing improperly. They learn obedience there. They learn how to function as a human person in a community of other persons, which is what society is. And I think that a large reason why we have uh, the difficulties and struggles that we have with children today, whether it be in a classroom setting uh, or, or, or to more... Uh, um, tragic means uh, where we see shooters in schools is because these children don't know how to function with others because the family unit is broken and they need both parents and I just want to go on the record saying children need a mom and a dad 
They need a mom and a dad. And when we deprive them for any reason, divorce or same-sex marriage or whatever the case may be, we are doing a grave injustice that, to that child. And I have to say this, it's, it's a form of child abuse, but it will mm. not be recognized because of the ideology that's behind all right. of this. It, it's about an ideology, exactly. not because this is good or makes sense. Right. It's about, it's just about the forwarding of, of, of a perspective, point of view. Right. I mean, in, in starting with the positive, it's very important for our audience to remember is, you know, the building blocks that we're talking about. And, you know, Paul Benedict talked about this in a reflection on the family that I've always used in my own presentations, is where's the first hospital? Where's the first school? Where's the first act of charity? It's all in the home. Right. It's where the child learns these values, not only for the, for the child's sake, and for the family's sake, but as you said very beautifully, for society's sake. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, for example, if all of us in the United States decided to riot, there are not enough policemen and military in this country to take care of over 300 million people. You know, so what does the society base itself on? Law. It bases itself on us upholding the law, following the law. Well, the law of God is given to us in the same manner. And God uses husband and wife, mom and dad, to convey his law, both tablets, both the love of God and the love of neighbor. And so when those are ruptured, and that's what we're talking about, a rupture here. So when we see mom and dad, either as husband and wife, not fulfilling their duty, so not conveying to their children what God has entrusted to them, there's harm done to the child, done to the family, done to society. But when you rupture that marriage, so you separate husband and wife, that rupture causes another level of rupture, becomes a subculture that's created now. And that creates a whole nother language. And so now you have a child that is supposed to be in a whole environment where the child under normal conditions receives the fruit of that love, now has got a mom and dad in two different venues, going back and forth, you know, we see what happens as a consequence. And, and I think, you know, it's important for us to see that this is not of God's will, that, you know, that what we see in the divorce mentality, we see in the cohabitating mentality, this is not of God's will. This is not of God's plan. You know, he has made man for woman and woman for man in, in, in that indissoluble, exclusive union. Why? Because this is the safe haven where a child receives the fullness of what God wants to convey to that child. And of course, we are sensitive to the fact that many, many right. wives and many men, by no fault of their own, find themselves in those situations because they've been abandoned. So we're very sensitive to that, but that again is not the ideal. And a single parent home is not the ideal. It's not what God has created for the gift of his family. And so it makes it a difficult conversation because it, it's sensitive and, and we're not being ins insensitive to anyone. No. And it's good that we talk about it, but we also need to be sensitive in what are we doing to help single parent homes? What are we doing you know, as parishes, as priests, as bishops, as lay faithful to support the family? So that, that becomes um, behooves us to get into that conversation. Well, you know, and Father, as you're speaking here, of course, uh, and we're very well aware of the fact that this is sensitive. And uh, if you are an individual who is divorced or if you're a child, now an adult, uh, who was raised in a broken family, we understand the difficulties there. There's not any family today, I, I couldn't name very many, maybe one or two, where divorce is not somewhere, if not in the immediate nucleus of that family, in the extended family right. uh, that is part of that clan. Uh, but the reality is this, if we don't talk about these things, then we just continue to let them proliferate. And I think it's fair to say that in addition to, you know, th this whole notion of, of being there to help uh, families, you know, we need we need to be there to help struggling marriages. Right. We have programs within the church, of course, right. Retrovi, et cetera, but, but we need more than that. Yeah. Uh, we, need, we need mentoring couples that will help individuals to make it through the rough times. Exactly. Uh, we need individuals who are willing to step into that gap, you know, and, and to uh, sit down and have a very serious, frank conversation exactly. with the one who is thinking of leaving. And if we spoke about this more, and may I say, Father, if this were spoken from the pulpit, we would at least encourage a couple that might be sitting in the pews that's struggling to dig right. a little deeper. Exactly. But today, 
A false sense of compassion leads us to uh, dare not to tread right. on these delicate issues, and so things continue. Uh, you know, and, and, and one of the big areas that, that I really want to mention uh, before we go to the bottom of the hour here, I really do want to mention you know, this gender ideology mm -hmm. that, as I mentioned uh, in the open, it has us as a culture in its icy grip. It and even Catholics are succumbing to the false notions right. presented by this very false ideology. Exactly. exactly. Exactly, and, and, it, and it's the false ideology that we, we can talk about and maybe pick up again, is, is because it really is the starting ground. And we, we call it behavioral modification. Mm -hmm. And this is what's been going on in the sex education programs in the schools now for, for decades. And I think many parents are just unaware of what's happening around them in the secular environment of which their children are very much influenced. So just like recently we had two uh, drag queens giving uh, you know uh, 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 story time in the library. In the library, yes, and, you know, this is a big trend. And, and we're seeing this as something good when it's something that's not good, not good for children, but it's not even good for us as a culture and so but this has been now where people have been taught to be tolerant they've been taught never to say anything we have to desensitize people I mean just recently there was a, a common you know in a, in a uh, business where a child was in, in wrongfully mistreated by, by an employee, but now the business says we're going to have to bring everybody to sensitivity training. So it's really about propagandizing. It's about trying to change how people think about man, about woman, about marriage, about human sexuality, about children. You know, this whole gender is, uh, even you know, the Holy Father has been irate on this subject. I mean, very vividly irate, saying to children, they're, they're propagandizing our children, what he calls colonization, uh, ideological colonization changing the way people think. Well, this is not something that's happened overnight. So this is what we're seeing is the fruit of many decades of intrusion into the language, how we vision life, family, human sexuality, male, female. So I'm not surprised how rapidly this gender theory and ideology is growing because the ground is ripe. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very ripe. And so people are very much caught in a disillusion. But that goes back to what we started talking about when we have a false anthropology, when we have a right. false understanding of who man is, who woman is. And even the Holy Father said, how dare they, you know, uh, not recognize that the, the biological nature of the person, man, woman, helps us identify us, who we are, and, and, and shapes our lives. And, and, to, and to deny that is not reality. No. It's delusion, and we live in deceit. Yes. Uh, one of the things that can, oh, and I just have to mention this, I'm sure that you've seen the pictures of Celine Dion's new line of clothing I for have. children. I mean, it, it's frightening. Yes. I mean, it's frightening to look yes. at. It's just frightening clothing. Right. And these little children look like they're, you know, that they're zombies. Uh, who wants their child to look like that? I exactly. can't figure. There's no joy in these exactly. little models' eyes, and I, that's intentional. Right. Uh, but who would want to put their children in things that um, look like they be, they're part of a satanic coven. Exactly. You know, so exactly. it's very upsetting uh, what they're doing there. And I want to give these numbers again. Friends, you are welcome to join us here. Join in the conversation, 800-221-9460. That is your number if you are in North America, 800-221-9460. It's toll free. Or if you're outside of North America, 205 271 2980. Don't forget, EWTN Radio social media Maven is there for you today, and he will get your questions up here. Just go to EWTN Radio's YouTube channel or Facebook page. You talk about this false anthropology. And this goes all the way back, I think, to Humanae Vitae. Right. And this, I think, was the essence of what uh, Pope Paul was teaching us in this, is that you cannot begin to abuse the way in which the human person was created and the functionality of the human person and think that this is going to end well. Exactly. So if you begin with this notion that I am in control of my reproductive system and I can use it in any way I desire right. to, uh, then we discover that pretty soon the free Fruit is bad. Exactly. It's rotten. Yeah. And look where we've exactly. come. Well, here. look at the example of, of, of the high percentage of pornography mm -hmm. and how many people are addicted to pornography. I've been told, and I'm, I'm still trying to find the research on it, by very reputable people that I trust in, in, in helping me you know, do research when I write articles and columns. And I've been told that the satellites, the communication satellites that even EWTN relies upon, that over 50% is used 
to support the pornography industry. Mm -hmm. But that would make sense because, I mean, look at, look at the culture. Look yes. at what, how we treat sexuality, how we treat sex. And, we, and we, we treat it as if it's a recreational sport. So we, again, we, we've disconnected it from its proper place, its proper role, and the beauty that it is. And I think that sometimes we as Catholics are accused of you know, being hard on, on subjects and not wanting to talk about them in a, in a good light. But, but we look at all this as something beautiful. Marriage is beautiful. Human sexuality is beautiful. And yeah, and I just want to say, you know, uh, the church, far from being opposed to sex, is far. the greatest uh, champion, <laughs> you know, of, of that intimate embrace of husband and wife. We wouldn't <laughs> be here. And we acknowledge its sacredness. Yes. And this is the beauty exactly. of, of what we have. And so, friends, uh, when we come back from the break, more with our guest, Father Sheenan Bouquet. want to give you those numbers again. 800-221-9460. We're ready for you. 205-271-2980 if you're outside of North America. And remember, again, to use EWTN Radio's YouTube channel and Facebook page. We are looking forward to your questions, comments, insights, and inspirations. Thank you for being with us. Stay with us through the break. We're going to be right back. See who's coming to the Pinto House on At Home with Jim and Joy. Next time, Layla Miller and Trent Horn advise parents on how they can effectively teach their children to handle moral issues in today's society. At Home with Jim and Joy, here on the Global Catholic Network, EWTN. St. John Vianney's priesthood changed the world. Now, the heart of this priest will bless our nation. Join the faithful of Washington, D.C. to honor the patron saint of parish priests and pray for our nation's clergy and healing for our church. EWTN takes you to the Basilica of the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception for the solemn mass and veneration of the incorrupt heart of St. John Vianney, Sunday at noon Eastern, here on EWTN. Immaculate Virgin Mary, Mother of our Lord Jesus and our Mother, filled with the most lively confidence in your all-powerful and never-failing intercession, I, your loving and trusting child, implore you to obtain for me the favor I earnestly ask, if it is beneficial to my immortal soul and the souls for whom I pray. Obtain for me a deep hatred of sin and that purity of heart which will unite me to God alone, so that my every thought, word, and deed may tend to his greater glory. Amen. With deepest humility, I adore you, my Lord and my God. You have made my soul your dwelling place. I adore you as my creator, from whose hands I came, and with whom I am to be happy forever. Amen. Welcome back, friends. We're visiting with our guest, Father Sheenan Bouquet, and we're talking about some tough issues today. I mean, we're really facing the reality of what's happened in our society with the collapse of, of marriage, the family institutions breakdown, uh, this gender ideology that seems to hold sway over all of our institutions, and we have to say enterprises as well. And, uh, you know, we're talking about uh, the, 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 the sad situation that's occurred in Ireland, and it sounds very bleak. And I have to say this. I mean, Father is... Um, you know, a man of hope, and I'm a man of hope too, mm -hmm. but nothing good's going to happen if we don't get about the business of doing it. It's our responsibility, <laughs> right. isn't exactly. it, Father? Well, you know, the, the situation in Ireland, of course, like anywhere, there's always opportunity for transformation, renewal, conversion, amendment, and of course that has to be our starting point, that we want to see the good flourish, and we want to see people re-embrace the good, and of yes. course that's what our Lord's words in the Gospel of Matthew, repent 
and believe. That's so right. this is our message as well. And, but the difficulty that we saw happen in Ireland of recent, the two referendums, one on the issue of opening the possibility for the legalization of abortion, and of course the, the, the one before that was on you know, em embracing same-sex union. And, and people were shocked. You know, how could Catholic Ireland, and, and I say this and with great respect to my brothers and sisters in Ireland, I've been to Ireland many times uh, to work with uh, the bishops and priests and, you know, in, in many lay programs trying to support a change within in, in this, in people's mindset. And, but it's decades again where uh, the same thing that we see in our own country and we see in Europe. And, and I think what you said a little earlier, Jeanette, was very, very good. And it reflects a little bit of the mentality that I've seen in Ireland. We want to be like Europe. Mm -hmm. So even though they see the horror of Europe, which is dying a million less Europeans every year, and they look out and they still want to embrace this, tells you how deeply rooted in what the systemic problem is. So nothing happens in a vacuum. So decades of propaganda, decades of, of a, fall, a poor catechesis, poor formation, all the things that we, we all know, well, this is what caused people to embrace, you know, a mentality that in their heart and mind, you even hear people say, well, I don't believe in same-sex union, I don't think it's good, but who am I to judge? Who am I? I I'm, I'm told that we have to be tolerant. So people are ill-equipped to be able to answer the question. They're ill-equipped to give a good, sound, logical explanation, something the natural law teaches us, very simple, and yet they're ill-equipped. So what happens is this wave just overwhelms them. And very sadly, as very sadly we have here in our own country, the scandals that we see both in civil society, we see inside the church, these are weapons of the evil one to use against us. And, and so it kind of it, it makes people cower back, mm -hmm. you know, because they're afraid that people will know, maybe look what I've done, or look at the things inside the church. Who are you as the church? Who are you as the priest or the bishop to say these things? Look at all that's happened. But that's, the, that's an attempt to bully us to not come out and speak the truth. And we have to, not, we have to see that and not be intimidated by that. That's right. And we need to stand our ground. But what I saw in Ireland, I'm watching happen in the Philippines as well. I'm watching happen in different parts of Latin America and in Asia. It's the same strategy because it works, sadly. It's worked. It's working here in our own country. I mean, look at, look at how intimidated we, we are. You know, you do a, a public interview and you've got to be careful what you say because if you say anything that's counter-cultural, you know, They'll, they'll hit you with a defamation, they'll hit you with a discrimination suit, and people's uh, licenses have been revoked, doctors, therapists, pharmacists. See, this is all bullying mm -hmm. techniques, and, and we have to see that this is diabolical, that whether we're talking about gender theory, whether we're talking about the issues of same-sex union, whether we're talking about the assault on marriage and the redefinition of marriage, all this is spiritual, and people in, in our audience, I know, are aware of that, but most people in, 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 in the civil society don't see it. They just see this purely from a mm -hmm. civil perspective, right. which makes our task all the more harder, more difficult to really bring people to that to, to our our side of the equation. Absolutely, Father. But we keep trying. Of course, you know, and um, logic is always on our side, and that's the beauty of the faith. I mean, the interior logic of the teachings of the Church are, are right. fascinating. Correct. They're wonderful. You look at our, our Catholic social doctrine, uh, and and you realize that you know how how do you find an error or a fault in it? It's about human flourishing, the common good, solidarity, the principle, exactly. uh, and the principle of subsidiarity. Right. When you look at that, I mean, those are the keys to that. You know, if something promotes human flourishing, it's a good right. because the human person is the apex, the pinnacle of God's creation. Uh, right. Unfortunately, we don't let the higher faculties of the soul you know, take take control. Correct. It's the passions. Correct. We give in to the lower faculties of the soul, but they've always got to be subjected to intellect, to exactly. reason. Exactly. You know, and, and, and that blend, that, that integration right. in the teachings of the church is so clear and so evident. Amen. All we have to do is read it. Exactly. Uh, and I would really encourage you to do that, friends. Get out there. Get the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Get into the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Begin to read it. Read some of the encyclicals. Uh, Father mentioned Veritatis Splendor, right? right. Uh, read that beautiful beautiful encyclical. Read Christi Fidelis Laici. Yes. You know, if, you, if you've never read Humanae Vitae, please do read <laughs> Humanae Vitae. Right. Very small, very sharp, very easy. <laughs> it's very accessible to you intellectually and in every other way. So, get, you know, we've got to, we've got to uh, really feed 
our minds, we've got to feed our knowledge base, and then we'll have the cogent argument to make to someone. Exactly. Let's go to Jean. She's calling us from New York today. Good morning, Jean. How are you? Hi, Trinette. Uh, good morning. Um, I'm, I'm uh, here 14 years on Long Island from western Pennsylvania, and I have to say I had one of your relatives in the hospital as a nurse, and, and mm. she convinced me to watching The Abundant Life, and I've been watching ever since. Oh, wonderful, Jean. <laughs> wonderful. You'll have to just tell our screener who that relative was yes. so I can locate it. <laughs> but nonetheless, I'm, I'm so happy you're with us. Thank you. I'm happy uh, that we have you as well. And uh, uh, my concern is, uh, you know, I hope someday that maybe EWTN makes a movie, something like uh, on Ma Margaret Sanger, like the uh, one at uh, Wolf in Sheep's Clothing, which relates to my question is, you know, how do we brainstorm uh, and come up with ideas on how to defund Planned Parenthood once and for all and take away good, hard-earned taxpayer money from going toward a really very bad cause? Well, I'll okay. tell you what, Jane, it's an excellent question. I'm going to let Father answer the question, but I do want to tell you, EWTN does have a docudrama on Margaret Sanger, uh, several as a matter of fact. So I would invite you to get out there to EWTN's religious catalog, EWTNRC.com. There's enough for everybody to get a copy of what's there. So I invite you to do exactly that. I think that you'll be, uh, I think that you'll be amazed at how thoroughly uh, it, it, it has been explored. The other one I want to recommend to you is um, A Wolf in Sheep's Clothing uh, that really is about Saul Alinsky and community organizing, which I think has been a key player in advancing these agendas. Exactly. So now I'm going to let Father answer the rest of your question. Well, since you brought up Saul Alinsky, I think it's, a, it's a very important because it's really how do you influence the structures of influence. Mm -hmm. And so when we look at how the whole agenda that we've all been talking about here, including the whole agenda of, of International Planned Parenthood, That's right. which is not just a, a U.S. affiliation, but it's global and this is something that we fight all the time and so many people believe that uh, that Planned Parenthood is prom promoting because it's their is their agenda it's their so-called uh, uh, public face that they're providing you know these very good things for women and good things for families but but really it's you know it's promoting you know abortion globally it's, it's strategizing how to in encourage abortion to become legalized in many other parts of the world and so how does it work well it influences the structures of influence so what I mean by that is government, NGOs, United Nations, for example, uh, working in judicial system, social media. You look at how it's intruded into the medical, into the, into the scientific realm, how it's gotten into the teaching realm. So these are the structures of influence that affect all of us in humanity. So governmental policies, you know, if we look at the foundations, for example, many of them used to be very good foundations, working in very admirable, you know, charities and, and accomplishments. But today, most of them, especially the ones at the Ford Foundation, the, the Soros Foundation, the Melinda and Bill Gates Foundation, you know, and so many others are so now engaged in dabbling, not just dabbling, engaged in population control That's because right. people don't know what this is. So my suggestion to Gene and to all of us is we have to become self-educated. So not only know, what about Saul Lewinsky? What did, what did he promote? What was the agenda? Who is Margaret Sanger? What is she all about? What was her, her issue of eugenics? And, and I think that's, that's the, the key here. That's the Planned Parenthood. The, exactly. People don't understand it, but where are your Planned Parenthood clinics? Exactly. They're in black communities that's correct. and Hispanic communities. That's right. And where do they go in the world? To those very same communities. That's right. And some of the poorest parts of the world. I mean, here in the States, we know that the highest percentage of abortions are among the black population. Hispanic is second in this country. And most people, and I give an example, I gave a presentation in one of these communities of re, uh, recently, about a couple of years ago, excuse me, and the, the local Baptist pastors that were part of this meeting of clergy were, were irate when they learned of what was happening in the neighborhood. So many people don't realize what Planned Parenthood is and does. And so this is part of the education, the formation. And I think that we owe a lot of uh, 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 commendable work to the people in the pro-life movement who've been exposing you know, Planned Parenthood and exposing all of the evil that happens. And I think we need more of that. And we have to continue to infiltrate uh, because that's what they do. That's what they've done into all of the things I'm talking about in the structures of influence. Now, for us, as, as Catholics, what are the structures of influence that we do? Well, we start with our families, is what we started the program on. And That's we, right. We in our family is where we have to teach. Father Marx used to say that contracepting parents produce fornicating children.
Oh my gracious! No, that's, that's a, a big very statement. statement. Isn't it? So I apologize to our audience for a little more bluntness. No, I'm very happy. It's it's an important thing because think of this: this mentality is passed on to the children. That's right. Because if the parents become selfish and self-centered, what do the children learn? So this is how people like Margaret Sanger and Marie Stopes International, Marie Stopes in, 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 in the UK, how they were able to bring this message. It's discriminatory, it's very much racial involved, and people just need to open their eyes. Margaret Sanger is not a saint. No. And, and I think that this, many people are trying to promote her as some saintly entity that, that has done well for women. Read what this woman has said. And you'll realize that she's not. Well, and, and this is the irony. Um, there is nothing, absolutely nothing, that is f uh, helpful for women in this anti-life establishment. Right. It is misogynist at its yes, core. Exactly. It tries to take the very fundamental reality of the female person and destroy it. Exactly. Uh, and, and we just we, we continue to think, well, it's it's a right. It's not a right. It's not your reproductive system. Church. You did not create it. No, exactly. <laughs> the fact of the matter is the church does provide yes. means to space children and exactly. it is more effective than the pill, far safer, and the rate of divorce is far lower exactly. in families that use natural family planning. And we planning. need to teach it. We're not teaching this, unfortunately, which you mentioned earlier, but, you know, from the pulpit in our, in our parishes, in our dioceses, you know, we need to see natural family plan and regulation being taught and, and helping couples to understand. But it's interesting, you know, uh, uh, when teaching this, I told a young man who said, you know, I don't see anything wrong with uh, my wife and I using contraception. So I said, what you're saying to your wife is this, darling, I love you, everything about you, but your fertility. Mm -hmm. now, Everything's good about you except the fact except, that you can bear children, exactly. my children. That's right, exactly. So, I mean, that, that's the mentality mm -hmm. and, and the whole understanding of, 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 of the beauty of self-giving and self-donating is thrown out the window. Mm -hmm. But again, this is the culture that's been created. Yeah, don't want to do this, but we've got to go to another break. So, friends, we're going to go to a break. When we come back, more with our guest today, Father Sheenan Bouquet. We're here to take your calls, to take your questions, and just give us a ring. We're going to be right back. Stay tuned. For years, Father Leo Clifford has been a treasured member of our EWTN family. Even though we have never met, I know something very personal about you who are listening to me. You are desperately searching for peace. His simple yet profound messages touch every aspect of Catholic life. That you and I must believe in faith that God is madly in love with us at every moment of the day and night with a love that never wavers, never wanes. Now, EWTN Publishing brings you all these treasure teachings together in one volume. Reflections with Father Leo Clifford. Father Leo has helped countless souls grow closer to Christ. Now he can help you too. Reflections with Father Leo Clifford. The latest release from EWTN Publishing. Now available at EWTNRC.com. Welcome back, friends. We're visiting with our guest today, Father Sheenan Bouquet, and we are very, very interested in having you share in the dialogue. We've got some minutes left here. You can call us. Numbers are on the screen for you there. Uh, very fascinating discussion, very important discussion. And we do have a Facebook question, Father, and here it is. It's how do we stand up for family 
and the unborn when the world labels us as haters for doing so. And again, this is part of that uh, uh, gender ideology that prevents us from feeling as though we can speak. Right. Yeah, it, it, it's back to it's a bullying tactic. So, you know, that when we have to really recognize, like 40 Days for Life and many others that have been doing sidewalk counseling for decades, you know, which is commendable and we need more people out there. But what happens is, is that you're intimidated. I mean, you, you have to realize that they're going to come out and some people are going to be insulting to you. They're going to be vo ver verbal, uh, vulgar. But you see, that's an intimidation. So what we need is more people to come out, more families to come out, to, to, to really be, is the, op, the, the, the choice here is not to pull back. The choice is to go forward. You know, you don't run away from the fight, you run toward the fight. Yes. And I think, but we need more people to do this. And, and so the question is a very good question because what I see is people cowering, not because they're cowards and not because they're frightened, but because of the same thing. They're worried about, am, am I gonna be sued? Am I gonna get a discrimination uh, 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 fine attached to me? Am I gonna have to pay some enormous fine? Are my kids gonna get kicked out of school? Which are all legitimate questions. Right. And this is where, again, we also, we, we need to pull together. We need to pull resources together. So what I try to encourage people to do is build networks. So for example, 40 Days ha already has a very established program, which is working remarkable all over the world. I'd encourage people to get more involved in this, but there are also others similar to it throughout the year. And so it's to not just do it during certain periods of Lent and right. Advent, but to really go out throughout the year, but to be trained, to yes. be formed. You don't want to go out there without being properly right. formed because you can set yourself up for difficulty. And if you go as groups, and so what I've encouraged, for example, when I was back in the parish and back in, in, in diocese, you know, we would try to build, you know, particular weekends. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so we're all going out. I'm going out. You can come with me. So you, you use people who already are involved kind of as your shield. That's true. And that's, that's an excellent strategy, Father. And I just want to say to you, my dear, that here, here is one thing to consider. You know, our Lord was ridiculed. He was mocked. He was, uh, he was, he was mistreated. He was misunderstood. Uh, people hurled accusations at him all of the time. Just read sacred scripture. If you take those assaults that might happen to you if you speak out and attach them to his suffering, you become a conduit of that redemptive grace Amen. in that very situation. And it might bring a power. No, it will bring a power uh, and an effectiveness that would not have been there without that. So actually, it's a great moment because you are willing to stand there in the presence of our Lord and in his name. Uh, and goodness sakes, what could be better than that? We have Melissa with us, and she's calling us from New York, Father. Good morning, good. Melissa. How are you? Good morning. I'm very well. How are you? Dandy. Thanks for asking. I have a question. I'm a faith formation uh, teacher. I teach 10th grade, and I've been teaching um, these groups since uh, they were in first grade. Oh, um, wow. But I have not found um, any curriculum whatsoever that really teaches theology as a body um, to these kids because they're being, kept, they're being educated in the schools on secular sex ed. They're being filled, you know, at the school in terms of... Well, Melissa, may I, may I just say they're being propagandized and indoctrinated with a very false ideology. Uh, and I want you to answer that, Father. We've got about three minutes left in the program. Mm -hmm. And, and I want to just state that I was recently in uh, Canada and had a mom come up and talk with me, Melissa, about, uh, you know, a similar issue. What can we do to kind of uh, gain back... Uh, the the truth for our children Correct. and she was telling me that in Canada age five they're talking about sexual right. acts that I could not even mention on the right. air here yeah, so they're teaching children they are. this and, and it's so, a global and it's a global issue what I would say mm -hmm. to Melissa first of all is as a teacher which I, I want to thank you for what you're doing as a catechist is you yourself just need to become self-informed you know be aware of what the church teaches read the, the documents and, and the teaching of the theology of the body read uh, these wonderful uh, catechism texts and bring those into the classroom. That's that's the way to supplement the, what's mm -hmm. not out there. And she's right. There are very few catechetical texts that have thus far integrated that teaching, which is a tragedy. There are some good ones out there, but they're not enough. Yeah. But we, uh, but with it comes to the propagandizing, I think in Guatemala, for example, you know, we sh exposed a program in the public system where they're teaching five and six-year-old girls and boys how to use a condom 
how to use the various and, and, to, and to experiment. So for what I would say to our parents who are listening, to anyone listening, is be on guard. That understand that inside our school systems, from as very early as kindergarten, they are being propagandized. We call it systematic behavioral modification. So if mom and dad are teaching you a value, a good value, a moral value, gospel value, the school is unraveling that. Mm -hmm. So you have to become aware and the unfortunate reality is, Father, the school has the children for more hours out of the day they than do. the parent does. Melissa has those children for perhaps Very one hour window. a week. Uh, so, friends, we've got our work to do, don't we? But we are not going to allow ourselves to be sidelined. We are not going to allow ourselves to be silenced. We are going to move forward because truth is on our side. And we're going to put on that armor of God that Father talked about. And we're going to get out into the fray. And we're not going to retreat. We're going to run into the battle. <laughs> and we are going to reclaim everything that's been lost in this culture, and we're going to preserve and protect that which is still God-honoring. I hope, I hope that is what you desire to do. Father, how great um, to have you with us. Thank you very much, thank and I hope to so be back much. again soon. Oh, you will be indeed. <laughs> and friends, we are so happy you're with us. We invite you to join us Monday through Friday right here on Women of Grace. Until we are together again, may God richly bless you. Bye-bye now. Coming up next, the Daily Mass, here on EWTN.